undergrad. Uh, also, there are a lot. Uh, also, there are lots of uh, methods and tools that uh, statisticians use, uh, and you may have used some some different things compared to what I'm using uh, in my analytical career. Um, and also, coding styles are very different. Uh, I believe that people on the call. Uh, know the uh, know some basics of R, I believe it was prerequisite, but don't worry if you're not, uh, if you're only just starting. Um, but as again, if you're, if you're more advanced, if you prefer using data tables, uh, it's totally fine as well, but I'm much more uh, deep liar slash base R person. Um, also, a couple of mat materials will be uh, on each slide as we go, so we will have this uh, on GitHub as a PDF. Uh, we can also share PowerPoint with you later. Uh, but just again, one disclaimer that Learning Statistics with R, a uh, tutorial made by Danielle uh, Navarro, was uh, absolutely brilliant book down resource. Uh, so, what I'm covering here is quite, based quite a lot on, on that book, but also uh, some things that are in that book we don't have time to cover. So, uh, if you're very interested, if you want to know more about certain things, I can highly recommend this resource. Um, also, we didn't ask you to download any data because we are going to use NHS datasets package. That is a brilliant package uh, being done by, uh, being created by NHS R enthusiasts who just put data together so people have um, access to various data sets and can use them in uh, while practicing their R skills. Uh, but also there is a very great book for free uh, on introduction to statistics, statistical learning with applications in R, slightly more advanced, but again, might be something you would want to have a look at in the future. Uh, so why are we even doing this? Uh, obviously, statistics is everywhere. It's became such a uh, like such popular word, uh, especially with the uh, times we live now. We live in pandemic. Uh, you also we also hear a lot about economics, things like growth rate. It's all statistics. Like every everything, ev essentially any uh, visual or just a verbal presentation of number can count as statistics pretty much. Um, and this, this, as I said, this workshop will be uh, mostly focused on descriptive statistics at the start. Uh, and this, and having, having done the descriptive statistics before you move to more uh, difficult, more complicated, more advanced modeling is vital because if your data isn't right, if you didn't identify outliers correctly, if you didn't spot data quality and you're trying to make conclusions uh, based on, on your data, that is going to be um, quite misleading, which is not good. Uh, because last thing we want to do is provide our decision makers with some misleading uh, conclusions. Um, also, um, I, I believe that it's statistics, both descriptive and just some more advanced methods like process testing is great because it's not time consuming at all. Uh, like in R, if you, if, you, if you tend to use Excel for things like minimum average and max, it's it's working and working great, great. But uh, the power of R when you just can write one code and do is what, like essentially what you would do in the pivot table, dragging things around, it's great. And obviously reproduci reproducibility is also um, great in R than in Excel tools. Uh, also, uh, I, th I believe that statistics is great just for our personal life. I mentioned how uh, much information and data we're being currently uh, bombarded with. It's uh, It's been a lot in the last uh, couple of years, especially. So when uh, we read some, uh, or what even in our day-to-day -day job as analysts, when we read some articles uh, in academic journals, it's good to be able to judge whether what is written is actually true or false. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, and um, also it's great to be uh, more careful as well when we share our statistics. So let's say uh, we can Regression modeling isn't going to be covered in this presentation, uh, but let's say uh, we have a regression regression model, we have some uh, results, but if we don't actually understand what the assumptions we made and what the limitations of our model are, uh, then uh, we, we would need to be more careful when we share results. And also just in the, in the spirit of Halloween, statistics can be fun, it's uh, it's great, and it's uh, it's great to be able to tell the story uh, using statistics. Um, uh, if, when you have thousand rows and uh, ten or twenty or hundred uh, different variables, uh, it's just great to be able to uh, get the messages out and deliver them. 
So this was just a rather long intro. Um, so as I said, the first part is just on understanding the data and it's focused on descriptive statistics. Uh, so what do we mean by this? Uh, descriptive statistics, as it is clear from the name, uh, using to describe. Uh, so we use it to describe the data. Uh, there are various, uh, there are, it, in, it includes quite a few different things. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, when we're trying to understand what we call univariate data, so only uh, data consisting of one variable of one vector, let's say we have just a row vector of and the attendances being 100 yesterday, 110 today, 90 tomorrow, and so on, uh, we can um, we can look at different things. Uh, first and foremost, we can look at what we call central tendency, and I'm going to cover these things uh, in the more details in a second. Um, so things like mean, median, and mode. Uh, we can also look at how variable data is, uh, and we can also see how it's distributed, which can then be more helpful when you model the data. Uh, also, there are various ways to uh, understand the data when you have uh, it uh, when you have more than one variable. So let's say you have uh, you have two variables, you have uh, let's say 100 patients and you know their age and you know how long they uh, stayed in the hospital for. So then you can uh, try to understand whether age uh, is being related to length of stay, which obviously very simplified view on hospital settings and the way length of stay works. But then in, in theory, it can help you plan uh, your bets uh, and make operational decisions. Uh, and uh, Many of these things can be done visually or numerically, and we will do the mix of both in this workshop. Um, in R, there will be uh, a range of packages. So there are, for example, uh, packages called uh, Psych from, psychology, from the word psychology, uh, which was created by psychologists and sociologists uh, who have to deal with the data uh, on a daily basis as well. So this was very helpful for certain tables, contingency tables, and uh, when you look at statistics by a group. Uh, but also there are some, um, but also there are some uh, other packages as well. And uh, also lots of things uh, we can do in R with statistics, uh, our in just base package, because um, said when R was created, it was created as a, a statistical tool. So, uh, and one uh, prerequisite as well, uh, just, uh, just so we, uh, again, we, uh, we know what we talk about when we say about data. The examples I, I just gave were mostly discrete data. Uh, so we were uh, quantitative data, so numbers, age, length of stay, uh, it's a discrete number. However, we can also have continuous data, uh, which obviously we will cover in this uh, workshop as well, uh, but also qualitative data as well. Uh, and uh, some of it also will be covered in the workshop. So things like either original qualitative data, so when we have um, things in order, so we can have risk factors from le less le the least risky to most uh, risk uh, group, for example, for heart attack in the patients, uh, or let's say education as a school, like GCSC, A level, um, uh, undergrad, uh, post masters, postgrad research, etc., uh, and then uh, nominal data as well. So, as a health analyst, I believe uh, we all also um, sometimes use SAS data, and SAS data has a lot of nominal data in as well, such as ethnicity, uh, or for example, uh, the um, like the organization where uh, where ep episode happened uh, or region. So, things like geography as well. Uh, so this is the all uh, on the types of the data. Uh, now moving on to this uh, main descriptive statistics I have mentioned. Um, again, some of you might have been very familiar to you. Uh, we have mean, which is just an average, uh, very easy to calculate. We can calculate it manually on our calculators. We can do it in Excel. We can even quicker do it in R. Um, also median, uh, again, something being very, very uh, popular now. Uh, some of some of you might have heard that we need to use median rather than mean if our data is skewed. So you know, what does it mean? Uh, so median is just the middle value. Uh, so essentially, it's uh, if you have a number of factors, it's just whatever's in the middle. Uh, and uh, quite often, it's being 
uh, implied to the um, income. So we know that average uh, salary, uh, annual salary in the UK uh, or England, let's say about 37,000, uh, but we know that this uh, average is skewed by uh, very, very big earners, a uh, couple of people uh, who earn, let's say more than 200,000, but then uh, the median is how much at least how, well, how much 50% of the population earns is, will be much lower because it's not going to be affected by uh, the big values uh, on one of the spectrum of things. But likewise, uh, it can be uh, other way around. Your median isn't going to be affected by uh, very low numbers as well. Uh, also, if you do have extreme values in our data, we can calculate what we call trimmed mean. Uh, so uh, trimmed mean uh, just means that we are trimming uh, largest or bottom or both um, of our observations. Uh, so if let's say we have vector of things, uh, three, five, eight, 11 and 15, and then we have hundred uh, based on the context, it may be slightly concerning and we may assume data quality issues. So let's say uh, we are looking at, um, I don't know, uh, number, well, number of kids, for example, highly uh, unlikely someone could have 100 kids uh, in their lifetime. So obviously we can then assume data quality. But if something less clear than this, I don't know, uh, so, so something that, that, we can, that can be 100, then uh, we can just use statistical rule and say we want to trim 10% uh, uh, of, of the most extreme values and calculate mean uh, this way. Uh, and also mode, uh, mode is not as common in uh, uh, numerical data sets, but it's quite, it's, it can be quite helpful sometimes as well, uh, mostly with qualitative data, and it's just the most common value. Um, so in this example with vectors, it's just eight because you have eight being, uh, uh, being written twice. Um, so we quickly covered on if mean or median is better. Uh, and uh, it's quite, um, it's quite, as I said, quite a popular topic now as well. Uh, the nice thing about mean is that it can be used when you have a low number of observations, because uh, if you only um, have like three or four, then median might not be as helpful because you have a very small sample. Um, and if your data is uh, qualitative, then obviously you can't do mean and median anyway. Uh, but if your data is original, so as you said, if you have, for example, um, risk factors from one to five, um, average risk factor is good, uh, but having a uh, median is slightly considered to be slightly better practice. Uh, if you have proportions and ratios, uh, so if you have, let's say, continuous quantitative data, and if you have proportions and ratios, you can use either. Uh, again, this is uh, more about how to tell the story using your data. So let's say we have, a, we as health analysts in the NHS, we are asked to look at how quickly providers, uh, uh, or rather how much active activity providers are doing now in uh, so-called post-COVID uh, world uh, compared to pre-COVID levels. And let's say we look at ratio of how much activity is being conducted uh, in November 22 compared to November 2019. And then you can, for this different, uh, uh, when you compare trusts, you can, in theory, both use average recovery rate or median recovery rate. It's just going to be slightly different messages. Uh, and both of them might be helpful. Uh, it just depends on what the stakeholder who wants analysis, what they have asked. Um, and also, uh, in terms of trimmed mean, as I quickly mentioned earlier, uh, sometimes it's obvious that you need to trim your mean, and in that case, you can just remove this very, very uh, suspicious data point. Uh, in some cases, it's less obvious. Um, like you know, if you if you have extra of age and you have most of people being aged uh, between 60 and 70, and you have one person aged 105, you can, in theory, have person aged 105. Uh, so that's why uh, that's when you might want to uh, just do the trimmed mean, but then report that you calculated that way. Uh, so also the, uh, as a, not just analysts, uh, public sector analysts or people from academia, uh, I'm not entirely sure background, people on this call, 
uh, we just know that sometimes data is tidier than, than uh, other. So we know that we can somewhat to carry rely on acute data, uh, but using data from um, like, uh, other sectors uh, might be slightly trickier. So this is the essential tendency. Before I move on to variability, uh, are there any questions about central tendency? Obviously, as it's recorded, people don't want to be on the call on the, in, in the recording. I uh, just pop the message in the chat. Um, so, in terms of measures of variability, uh, so let's say we know that uh, we have the, what we know what the mean of the of the of our uh, vector of data, or we know what mean. Uh, in our data set for different variables is. Uh, but let's say we want to know how much variation is in the data. That is a very, very common uh, question. Uh, so one of the simple things is range. It's just all the, uh, it's just all the um, uh, values from minimum to maximum. Uh, also, when you calculate your minimum and calculate your maximum, you might want to look at min to max ratio or max to min ratio. Uh, show where you want to do it. Um, as well, we have an interquartile inter range. Uh, so in here uh, below, you can see a little bit of explanation about quant uh, quantiles and quartiles. Um, so essentially what it means is that if you have, again, vector or some um, number of values, uh, we can split it all in equal, in equal parts uh, and then have a look at what the range between those parts is. So in this example, uh, our First quartile is our uh, first quarter of the data, and they have second quartile, same as our median, and we have third quartile uh, or 75th percentile, uh, which is uh, the top 25% of the data. And interquartile ranges are great, and I'm sure you have seen them in box plots uh, when you saw box plots, uh, but also it's being very widely used in uh, research papers as well. Uh, then you can want to, you might want to have a look at how your uh, how your how you how different your values are to your mean or to your median. Uh, That's why we have mean absolute deviation and median absolute deviation, um, which you have we have formulas here. Don't need to remember any of those, uh, but they're there if you want. Um, also the variance. Uh, so again, you get the deviation from the mean, but instead of taking absolute, you are taking uh, you, you, you're uh, putting it in square. Um, also, standard deviation is square root of the variance. Uh, and I will, I will explain in a second why we're doing this. Uh, but also, coefficient of variation is the same standard deviation, but it's just slightly uh, relative. So if you want to uh, have a bit of a, a bit more context of what uh, how much variation you have, you can calculate it as a ratio of uh, standard deviation to your mean. And one of the last things about theory, I promise, is this very big table, which again, I'm not going to talk through all of it right now, but there are certain cases when you might want to use uh, one, one uh, indicators of variation over the other. Uh, so uh, as I said, range is, is great because it gives you full, uh, full scope of data and so does max and mean, uh, but when you are, um, when you have outliers, it's not uh, it's not very great. It's not helpful, but it can be actually helpful to spot those. Um, also, you as uh, you have mean mean and median absolute deviation, and this is very easy to um, explain. Uh, but it's not as helpful when you that isn't normal distributed. Um, median is can can that's why people tend to use median uh, more because. Uh, the pretty much the perfect uh, normal distributed data pretty much never happens in in real life. Uh, also, variance is helpful. So the variance where we take a square, uh, sorry, where we have the uh, uh, the difference between value and mean, and then uh, for each of them summarize a square of those. Uh, it is helpful, but because it's square, it's not going to be the same. Uh, the kind of the, the, the same units as a date, if it makes sense. And again, we will uh, cover it now in practice. Uh, standard deviation is square root, so it's great. Uh, and also coefficient of variation is, as I said, good because you can do it relative to the uh, mean. 
Uh, so, and uh, if we will have time today, uh, I would just also like to say about one a package that again was built uh, by NHSR community and NHS England uh, team called Plot the Dots. Uh, so it's about statistical process control charts. So whatever we just discussed, both central tendency and variation, um, as I said, can be uh, calculated, calculated uh, very quickly in any uh, in any statistical software, uh, but also if you want to visualize it and make and try to understand whether your values are outside expected uh, range or not, uh, you can use so-called statistical process control methods. Uh, there are two of them. Uh, there are uh, final plots uh, here on the left. So let's say you have uh, different local authorities on this chart. Uh, you have your mean value. So some of them sitting right on the mean and you have your uh, kind of confidence intervals, so like intervals of the uh, expected uh, values. Um, you, you have three, three standard deviation from your mean and two standard deviation from your mean, uh, the dotted line. Uh, and then you're saying that if your, uh, if you if on this x, y, x, uh, x, y combination, your local authorities outside your con control limits, uh, it is an outlier. So this is quite helpful and can be done easily in R. But as I said, if you have time, I will focus more on uh, so-called SPC charts, which is a very similar thing, but for time series data. And it can be, again, very helpful both to spot outliers and also to, um, if you have a very quick question about it, we having, let's say, a lot of uh, and the and e attendances in our trust in last couple of months. Is it normal or not? And then you can uh, plot the data again, plot the up and low control limits as uh, either, um, let's say, three, three or two standard deviations uh, and see whether these data points are outside this control limits or not. Uh, so this is all of the uh, theory for now. So now I'm going to switch to my RStudio Cloud uh, and just give people a couple more seconds to uh, do the same. And I'm just going to post share so that if people have, sorry, not share, post uh, recording. So if people do have any troubles, uh, then we can discuss uh, the ways to get hold of data and scripts. Oh, it should have all the files. And can okay. So people opened, uh, yeah. And also, if you can give me a thumb up, if you opened and also can see what I can see, uh, which is uh, well, I don't know what it opens with default, uh, no files, but uh, you would you should have some files under the files in the bottom right. Okay, people can. Uh, if people are also going to code live with us, but going to use GitHub, uh, link is still in the chat. It's still the latest message, so it should be easy to find. Uh, again, I'm going to quickly uh, show it now. Uh, as I said, you can just download as, a, as an archive and open files as you go. Uh, it's possibly not the best way the files will uh, na name them, I'll rename them uh, later. But essentially, everything is underscore classroom is empty file, and everything without is uh, full code. So, if for any reason uh, you want, I mean, if you just want to open full code, you're very welcome to uh, and just run chunks. Um, I planned to use empty file, but as I was worried about technical issues and data, uh, I might refer to full code at some in some parts if I feel like we are running out of time. Uh, to, because some of the code is going to be gplot, so it's going to be lots of repetitive things. Um, so, uh, and in terms of the data, you don't need anything uh, because the data is in NHS data packages. So, uh, I guess, can people then either, yeah, either let me know in the chat or in the reaction, uh, but more like thumb down or set face or something if you have any troubles. So I assume that everyone is OK. Uh, and then I will uh, kick off with the uh, practical part now then. I'm just going to move my GitHub on the other part. 
cool. Uh, okay, so uh, great. Um, and again, I assume that people uh, do know R uh, and have uh, done some simple data imports, uh, data wrangling before. But if any questions, uh, just please do let me know in the chat. Uh, so in, in the chat is better than reaction because I might accidentally uh, miss your reaction if I'm staring at my screen for way too long. Um, so, okay, so now let's start then. Uh, so I believe that if you open my project, you don't need to reinstall packages again, uh, but I'm going to run uh, this part uh, just in case anyway. Uh, and I also added this part at the start of each file, even though I don't need to because you're going to use them one by one. Uh, I thought if you just do exercises on your own at some point in the future, uh, like doing part two without doing part one, uh, it might be good to have uh, packages installed again just in case, and we can do library. So as I said, I'm going to use uh, NHSR datasets package. Uh, so NHSR datasets package, uh, I'm, I might you should have link in the uh, in the slides, uh, but it has a number of datasets, and one of those is called loss datasets. So I'm going to um, get it open now. Uh, so loss dataset has uh, length of stay, uh, age, and death outcome where one is if person died and zero if not. Uh, for about 300 people from, I think, 10 trusts. Uh, so this is the uh, data, and just because we will use vectors a lot for the first couple of times, instead of uh, every time writing uh, mean brackets df underscore loss, I'll just uh, I just created those vectors to uh, assign uh, length of stay and age. Uh, so this is uh, hopefully uh, all runs fine for people uh, and for those of us who are uh, doing it from their uh, computers as well. Um, so, okay, uh, I might have some older version of something in my, oh, in my big one, in my big file. Yeah, it could be, I'm, I'm surprised. Oh, yes, I know what you mean. Yeah, this is a very good point. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is great. This is a good start. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, of course you do. Uh, right, thanks. Um, so yeah, so then let's do the simple central uh, tendency um, um, metrics then. So again, something I'm sure many of you have done before. Uh, in, 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 in a second as well, we will know that you can just use summary function and have everything at the same time. But if you just want mean or median, um, you can use functions mean length of stay or median length of stay. So, um, so this is uh, hopefully should be uh, should be okay for people. Uh, Um, okay, and then we can also, uh, as we discussed, do uh, trimmed mean. Uh, so, I mean, in our case, we can already see that mean and median length of stay are not that far from each other. So hopefully our data isn't skewed too much, but if we do want to trim, we can just um, use the same function mean, but instead uh, this time uh, we can use uh, next argument, which is trim. And let's say if you want to trim 5%, uh, we just uh, do trimming 0 0.05, uh, or we can trim uh, 0 0.1 uh, if you want to trim more. So this is the, um, the trimmed mean we discussed in the theory just now. Um, again, hopefully no problems for people just yet. Uh, and then in terms of, oh, we did mean before, let's skip the mean. Uh, if you want to find mode uh, of the um, of something, it's a function called mode of, uh, which is part of LSR package. 
Um, so let's say you want to see if you have mode of age, which uh, is just numeric values. So it might not be as in informative, but let's say we have we have vector anyway. Um, I will just see if you have any uh, repeated values. So we can do mode of age uh, is okay 69. So we have a couple of people age 60, uh, 69. It doesn't tell you much, but let's find out how many of them. And to find out how many of those, uh, we need to use a max frag uh, function uh, of the same package. Uh, so uh, max, frag, max frequency of age. Um, cool. So yeah, so these are the uh, measures of central tendency. Again, might be familiar to most of you uh, and uh, very easy to do. And we will find out how to do it all uh, in like in one go much, much quicker. If there are no other questions, and yes, please do correct me uh, as I go. If there are, uh, yeah, if there are any mistakes, uh, I will really, really appreciate those. Uh, but also if you, for example, just want to share, if you think there are better ways to do things, please also do. Um, so the next uh, one is uh, the uh, measures of variability, which again, we have uh, discussed as a theory. Um, so we started uh, from a thing called range. Uh, so range is just all possible values we have from minimum to max. Um, so let's say to do look at our range of length of stay, uh, we can, let's say firstly, want to have a look at max. So again, function called max. Uh, we have function called mean. Uh, so if you, uh, if you do those, uh, we have, we know that our uh, maximum length of stay is 18 days, which is more than two weeks, and our minimum is one day. Um, and then we can either subtract them one from another for range, or we can just use function called range and it will tell us that the range is from one to 18. Again, qu quite handy if you just want to have a look at something quickly, especially uh, with the amount of outliers and data quality we have to deal day to day, it's quite helpful. Uh, then uh, the next one is on the uh, ratios. So ratio is uh, just ratio of max to mean. So again, you could either assign values to your max and you mean here, or just uh, type it all over again. So I'm just going to type, type max length of stay divided by mean length of stay. So this is our max to mean ratio, but sometimes people use mean to max ratio. It's the same thing. So if you derive, if you calculate those, uh, it's obviously 18 because we know that our, uh, our maximum length of stay is 18 and our minimum length of stay is one. Um, so it's again, might not be as um, as helpful, but it's actually quite good when you have a couple of variables. So for example, if you do the same for H, uh, you might want to do the same for H, uh, just in case uh, you might then know where you have more variation in your H or in your length of stay. I mean, again, those are, would be more, uh, more obvious because you know that uh, there are like, there are only as many uh, as many years one person can live, uh, but length of stay uh, can sometimes be uh, more than a year in certain cases. Uh, but if, for example, you have more close indicators, let's say you have uh, a quality outcomes framework data you're working with, and you want to see what your uh, variation and prevalence of, uh, let's say, asthma versus variation and prevalence of diabetes, um, mean, to, mean to max or max to mean ratio can be more helpful. So we can do those as well. So these are the range, mean and max elements of it. Again, I cannot see any questions um, in, the, in the chat. There's no questions, Anastasia. Yeah, cool, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to move on to uh, quartiles uh, and, and, and quantiles. So as we discussed, uh, quantile is a um, metric uh, used when we split our data in equal, um, in equal intervals. Uh, so as we said, if we split our data in half, 
uh, the then our 50th percent percentile uh, will be just our median. But if we want to, we might we can test it again. So let's say from the uh, from the code below, we know that median of length stays four days. So if now we instead use function called, well, if I can type it, function called quantile. Uh, did I type it correctly? I think I did. Um, and again, say that we want to calculate quantile of length of stay uh, with uh, uh, next uh, argument is uh, props. Uh, so what is our cut point in our quantile? Again, if we cut 50%, uh, our 50% quantile is 4. Uh, but obviously, the this could be could have been done using slightly less uh, writing. Uh, so what we do want to use this function for is uh, to calculate our 25th uh, and uh, 27th uh, percentiles, or what we call quartiles, because they split date in quarters. Uh, so again, using the same function called uh, quantile, uh, instead, what we can do is we can have a couple of probabilities in our argument of this function. Uh, and we can specify those as uh, 0 0.25 and 0 0.75 uh, being uh, our quartiles. So if you run those, um, uh, we now know that our 25th percentile is 2 and our 75th percentile is 7. Uh, so we know that 25% uh, quarter of uh, people having a length of stay uh, 2 or less and 75 uh, having a length of stay 7 or less. Uh, and if you want to look at our inter interquartile range, uh, again, this is pretty much already there, uh, but there is even quicker way. Uh, function consisting of three letters, uh, IQR. Um, so, so we can just do it this way. Uh, so we can see that our difference between our quartiles is uh, five days. Uh, so these are the uh, quartiles, quantiles, and the interquartile range. And then I will move on uh, to the um, like de de deviations and variation. Uh, so, um, as we saw on the uh, so on the slide, uh, first and foremost, there are absolute deviations. So, taking absolute of uh, differences, there is one called mean absolute deviation and one called median absolute deviation. And unhelpfully, um, if you have a look at the abbreviation, they both sound absolutely the same, uh, which is uh, not helpful. Uh, so that's why R and some um, other literature sometimes using average absolute deviation instead of mean absolute deviation. Um, so I'm going to just type it here just um, so we know why our abbreviation and our function is called AAD, not MAD. Um, so uh, our AAD is, uh, again, how in absolute, uh, how far each value is uh, on average from average. Uh, so if you just do function, it's 2.95. Uh, um, so on average, um, our value is uh, about 2.95 uh, different from our mean. Uh, but uh, if you want to do it manually, um, just to reassure, then you can just type the kind of function uh, yourself. So uh, what you're doing here is you're taking absolute difference uh, between length of stay and mean length of stay uh, here. So you're taking difference, you're taking absolute of it, and then you're calculating average. So this is mean absolute um, deviation manually, which gives us uh, the same value, which is obviously good news. And exactly the same thing can be done for median. So in this case, it is called it's called MAD, so median absolute deviation, uh, which is deviation of value from median uh, taken for an absolute for all observations. And then we take median of this. Uh, slightly more difficult to, uh, for interpretation, um, but as I said, slightly more helpful when your data is skewed. So your median absolute deviation is very similar. We, we knew before our data isn't as skewed as we were it. Uh, so our mean and our median are quite similar. 
uh, and we ca you can do exactly the same thing uh, manually. So, I mean, you can very welcome to just keep this part for the sake of classroom being similar to full exercise. I might well just type it here. So I have it. Oh, is something wrong? Uh, okay, well, this is not the same, which is not a good thing. Okay, uh, I'll need to come back to it. So in the break. So yeah, bear with me. Okay. Uh, the next, okay, interesting. Okay, uh, the next one is the uh, the the variance and all the metrics derived, derived from it. So as we discussed, variance is very similar to deviations we just looked at, but instead of doing it in absolute, uh, we are using uh, the uh, square. Uh, so uh, our variation, again, can be calculated manually or, or using function. So function for it is just called var. So this is our variation. Um, again, not helpful. We are looking at length of stay, length of stays in days. Our variation is 13 days, but uh, a variation is square. So like it's it, that it's not necessarily the same as deviation and it looks surprisingly high because it's square. Um, but uh, we know that that's why we use certain deviation. Um, and if you want to do variance manually, I'm not sure why, 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 why would you want to, but uh, you just taking, well, using the very same function to our uh, average absolute deviation, but yeah, using the squares instead. So mean, and then you're taking square of the difference here, here. So I think should be correct. So you take loss, length of stay minus average length of stay, take it and square and take mean of it. So I think this should be working. Yeah, so this uh, is, uh, this is expected difference compared to one I had before. Uh, and the reason why uh, these numbers are different, uh, because in our calculation on line 48, uh, we are calculating it as a mean. So essentially we are summarizing all those and dividing it by N. This is why how you would calculate N. So you would divide your sum of all possible values by number of observations. Uh, but when R does its uh, variation um, itself, it assumes that you only have sample. So it does what is called um, uh, sample mean. So it divides uh, your, uh, it divides sum of your squares by n minus one. So in uh, this, in uh, this variation um, equation, you will have n minus one in denominator. Uh, so that's why you might have sometimes see the slightly different version of equation, but it's not it's not a big issue. And usually, when you do your summary statistics in a second, you will do it using just one function, and and it all will be um, standard variation uh, as this version rather than population mean. So this is the variation, um, and from variation. Uh, we can calculate standard deviation uh, because the standard deviation is just uh, mean square, uh, it's just square root of variation. Um, because we want to stick to function method as a slightly more uh, appropriate, we can just use function as d. Uh, now we have standard deviation of 3.6 days, which sounds much more reasonable given that our range is from 1 to 18. Uh, and that is uh, very helpful uh, in when you are looking at the uh, overall distribution of your variable. Uh, and last but not least uh, is coefficient of variation. So we know now in like absolute value, so we know our standard deviation is 3.6 days uh, and uh, the uh, we can have a look in kind of what what it means in terms of how big it is compared to our mean. Uh, so our coefficient of variation is uh, just our standard, uh, st st uh, st our standard deviation divided by mean. So again, we can just do 
a standard deviation of length of stay divided by mean of length of stay. Uh, and it's uh, 0 0.73. So uh, in other words, saying that 70, uh, so that our data uh, is deviating from mean uh, pretty much 73%. So uh, it's uh, actually quite, uh, quite a big, uh, but it's quite pointless on its own. Uh, but again, when you compare different variables, uh, you can see how uh, variation is differ differing, different. Or if you're comparing same variable, let's say in our sample of 300 observations, uh, our coefficient of variation is uh, 0 0.73. But let's say this is just for East of England re NHS region. But let's say we have separate uh, vector for let's say Midlands or Southwest uh, region. And then we can see whether there is more or less variation in length of stay. Uh, and if there are certain regions with more variation than other, uh, it might be then prompt different questions. Okay, why this happens? Why we have people in, uh, let's say Southwest, uh, not, not just staying, let's say longer or shorter on average than other regions, but also having more variability uh, within its episodes in, in trusts in this region. So this is uh, the kind of all the different metrics uh, we have looked at and just uh, to make things uh, slightly, uh, um, yes, slightly annoying that we had to type all these things ourselves. You all might know now that you have a summary called, function called summary and we will come back to other versions of getting some uh, summary systematically. Um, and uh, voila, it just tells you exactly the same thing. Uh, it tells you mean uh, for each of them. Uh, well, ID and organization are not as interesting, but let's say for age and length of stay and death, it gives you minimum value, uh, maximum value, mean and median, as well as your interquartile range as well. Uh, and for death, uh, which is dummy variable, a uh, meaning uh, zero, if uh, you uh, if the person didn't die and one if person died, uh, again still can be quite helpful because then your mean uh, is your average means you about seventeen point sixty seven percentage of your sample uh, have maximum value uh, so they uh, unfortunately had died. So these are the all the simple uh, simple um, kind of metrics. If there are no questions on that stage, uh, I only have kind of about five, 10 minutes uh, of the next se section. So I propose doing the more interesting part about why we're using one of these indicators over the others, then have a break. And then I'm going to talk a bit about uh, a statistical process controls charts as well. Um, does it sound okay to people? Or would people want to have break now? Okay. I mean, okay, I'm, 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 I'm still wearing your hands, Anastasia. Okay. Well, let's then do the uh, this kind of easy metrics done and dusted, have a tea yes. uh, uh, break, and then come back to interesting things. Cool. Okay. Like nice. So, on the uh, which metrics to use? Uh, as we just discovered here uh, in the death, uh, well, range is not helpful for our demi variables. Like it's, we can do this, uh, but it's going to be quite, uh, quite, quite uninformative, I should say, uh, because we know that uh, we have, uh, we know that uh, everyone is either died or didn't die, so it's either one or zero, and I guess absolutely the same is uh, with the maximum, for example. So this is. Uh, not helpful at all. Um, our interquartile range, uh, as I said earlier, is generally uh, quite, uh, qu quite helpful. Uh, so what I am um, going uh, to do is actually I haven't run this line yet, I don't think. So I'm going to run this line on the stranded, stranded data set. So it's slightly different data set and has slightly more variables. Uh, so I'm going to use, uh, use it instead. Uh, so this uh, can be quite good. So if I quickly talk through this one, uh, so stranded label uh, stands for what you call what we used to call stranded patients, but I don't think we use this term anymore. Is when patients stayed in hospital for 21, I believe, days or longer, 
and then you have uh, various, uh, you have age, you have admission date, you have front, uh, frailty index uh, that is a uh, character, but you can make it a factor. I believe it's about uh, five or so options. Again, we can just to summary, uh, find out. And then you have number of, uh, number of dummy variables, whether person's medically safe uh, to uh, discharge, care home referral, uh, and also uh, mental health care, as well as uh, periods of previously, previous care. So it's quite, again, quite good practice data set, can even be used for some simple regressions when you practice as well. Uh, and uh, then, as I said, if you look at interquartile range, uh, again, interquartile range might not be as health, well, still will be quite helpful for uh, the dummy variables, but more helpful for uh, for the um, continuous variables. So you know that you have people uh, being from, uh, well, if you do summary, different between min min minimum and maximum is 40. So you have quite quite a good range uh, and you you can do the just summary as well to find out what those are exactly. Um, so as we did just earlier with the legacy data set. Uh, in terms of uh, which coefficient of variation to, uh, which version of variation metric to use, uh, this is, I think, again, we covered quite well uh, already. Uh, variance isn't commonly used anymore at all. Standard deviation and coefficient of variation both used quite, uh, quite a lot, but st standard deviation is not as helpful when you compare uh, variation uh, across different metrics. Um, so uh, this uh, why um, I would not uh, I wouldn't use it uh, as much. Uh, coefficient of variation is just uh, again we we can type it all over again. We can just skip this part. I'm going to just type it here for my record. Stranded data set. Let's say h divided by mean. So, um, uh, and then we have looked at full summary statistics, uh, but what might be more interesting to look at, uh, I'm just going to actually copy it over there, so we have it, is to look at it for group. So let's say um, you're looking at the summary, full summary statistics here, uh, and you know that you have patient age from 21 to 81, you have some of them uh, being referred from care homes, some of them being uh, having history of mental health contact uh, and you know when they got admitted. But really what you might want to know is kind of what distinguishes those who got stranded in the, uh, in the hospital from those who haven't. Uh, so this is where the, in this particular example, what is quite interesting and quite helpful to have a look at, uh, let's say summary by group. So you can look at, uh, for example, variation by group, the uh, uh, the coefficient of variation by group, uh, or uh, you may want uh, to uh, look at like all the all the uh, metrics by group as well, and you can do it quite easily. Um, if you want to use base R, there is a, a, a function called by. So what it does is uh, it's just kind of way of, I guess, functional programming. So you can determine what you're grouping by and inside you will have, uh, uh, as you can see here, arguments such as data indices and uh, uh, function, uh, fun. Uh, so data is what your data is. Indices is what you're grouping by. Uh, so in our case, you would want to group by standard uh, la dot label. Uh, but you might want to group by frailty index to see, for example, what uh, are the uh, the what are the kind of descriptive uh, information about people with different frailty index you have, uh, and then you can do function. Uh, and in in our case, we want to do function summary because we want to get summary statistics of those. So if I type it right now with you, so our data is our stranded data set. Um, and our indices is well. We can we can uh, in theory don't write indices and just write argument by argument with the comma. But I'll do it just for our reference here. Uh, so our indices is stranded uh, dot yeah stranded dot uh, 
label. I think you need to type stranded data set in front as well. Um, and our function, what you want to do is summary, but likewise, you can just use any other function using this by, uh, by function. Uh, yeah, so I think this works. So this gave us summary statistics uh, by the um, uh, stranded and non-stranded um, groups. So this is uh, quite helpful to some extent. Uh, for example, our means and medians won't be as helpful for, let's say, minimum and maximum, because it looks like we have pretty much good representation uh, for age, for example. So our stranded uh, being stranded, age from 21 to 80, and our stranded label being not stranded, so our non stranded patients, our patients discharged before 21 days length of stay, are very similar age profile as well. Uh, but uh, still quite handy sometimes when you have uh, obvious groups, not as user friendly. So that's why in the psych package I mentioned earlier, which was created for psychology, so, and, uh, so, psychology and social uh, research, uh, you have function, oh, no, it's not this one actually. I think it's this one. Yes, you have function uh, described by without dot describe and from, by from capital letter. Uh, and you can do exactly uh, exactly the same thing uh, from, so you can get your data uh, and you can specify that you want to uh, group it uh, by the uh, stranded label. Oh yes, sorry, you do need to do the same thing again because um, it doesn't recognize the device as an multiplier, unfortunately. Um, Obviously, yeah, you can do this part of deploy, and you don't have to type data set again and again. But yeah, if you just do it as a standalone function. So this is slightly more user friendly, in my opinion. Uh, it kind of give, it kind of gives you the um, the very similar uh, to any like descriptive statistics you would see in the um, academic journals. So you don't need to then and try to understand each variable and compare it over. So you have very nice, uh, like row, uh, row by row structure. Um, so this is uh, actually used a lot. Uh, but last but not least, all this can be done by multiple groups. Uh, and I'm just going to show you last thing before the break is if you want to let's say uh, look at uh, look at mean age uh, by not just by stranded group, but also by stranded status and by frailty index, uh, you can use it. Uh, you can do it using function aggregate. Uh, so you can you specify that you want to have your age uh, being stranded label uh, and uh, the uh, frailty in the underscore frailty underscore index. Um, so this will then means that uh, you will have your, your you have two groups here. You're looking at age uh, as a function of stranded label and frailty index. Uh, you are still using so the second uh, argument is your data. So you're still using stranded data, stranded data set, uh, but uh, this time let's say you only want to have a look at the mean. Uh, so this again, a lot of information here. Uh, so we have four frailty indexes and two labels. And for each combination of those, uh, you can uh, see um, the average age of your patients. Uh, so this, I mean, this last two might not be as informative. Uh, well, it depends if no index item means uh, that there, there is no frailty or just missing value. I assume it means there is no frailty. Uh, if, if so, it makes sense uh, because People who are older tend to be more frail, so it looks very reasonable that people without frailty uh, are, uh, uh, are much younger, uh, but out of those stranded patients uh, on average are slightly older. So whether it's uh, actually significant difference or not, uh, we will find out after the break uh, at some point. So this is all on the descriptive statistics part of, the, uh, of the today's workshop. Uh, so I propose taking a break now and also I propose pausing the recording so then if people do want to like come 
with some specific questions and say things that are not recorded uh, so they don't have to worry. So I hope it sounds okay. I'm going to press post recording now myself. Cool. Um, so this meeting is being recorded. Okay. This uh, lady, uh, automated Zoom lady, terrifies me every time. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. welcome back uh, after the break. Um, so we started from Descriptive statistics, uh, some of you, uh, almost of you possibly already knew all the things. Um, and as a part of descriptive statistics, even though it's possibly slightly, well, it's still descriptive statistics classification wise, but it's slightly like more about time series analysis. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit a snapshot of how, what you can do if you want to look at time series uh, and try to understand, uh, oh, not necessarily time series, I mean, it could be. Um, you can use it for other. Uh, you can use other versions of this method for other uh, causes as well. But if you want to, let's say, have a look at time series and uh, make judgments on uh, whether uh, the data you're seeing, the data points you're seeing, are outside of what you would expect or not. So it's kind of built on all these things like mean and median and standard deviations, uh, because essentially what statistical process control methods do is they say. Uh, okay, uh, well, you can specify uh, by the saying that whatever is whatever is uh, outside our expectations, and our expectations is either three or two standard deviations, uh, is an uh, unusual pattern and might need to be looked at in more details. Um, I mean, obviously, these things can be now done. Uh, and you can say you can do exactly the same and say exactly the same message about interquartile ranges, for example. Uh, but uh, there, there is a lo lo uh, lovely package uh, being built by NHSR community enthusiasts, and that was why it should be good uh, to promote it here. Uh, it's called NHS Plotted Dots. I believe we installed it at the start, but I don't think we unpacked it yet. So I'm going to uh, unpack them here. Uh, unpack it here now, um, and you should have link. Uh, in the slides uh, with explanations, uh, but essentially it just makes your life when you uh, do a statistical process control chart so much easier. Uh, so for this exercise, I'm going to use a different data set from our NHSR datasets package. And this time I'm going to use and the attendances data set. Uh, if I look at it right now, uh, it uh, very similar to and it well, she's pretty much spot on and e data from NHS England or NHS digital website. So it's open data uh, at uh, organization level uh, where you can see by uh, and e type being one main and e, and you have two and other uh, such as minor work in units or urgent care centers. You, you can see how many attendances happened. Uh, you can see how many breaches happened uh, and breach being uh, people had to stay for longer than for, for hours and how many people uh, got admitted to hospital after uh, after attendance. And I mean, not as helpful, but unsurprisingly, it's a lot, there are a lot of zeros because we, we, uh, and just does not tend to admit people from uh, minor working unit, minor working centers and uh, um, uh, urgent care centers. It's only from the hospital from type one. Anyway, uh, what I want to do is uh, I want to just, let's say I work for one specific trust uh, and I want to do a time series and understand if uh, what we are seeing uh, now is uh, more than what we would expect or not. Uh, so, but I want to do two ways. So one of them is just using, uh, well, using, using ggplot. Um, uh, you can just, you can just, uh, kind of create time series and just try to eyeball it. Uh, but uh, it's going to uh, take quite a lot of lines. Uh, so let's say I'm going to use uh, the, um, uh, the the deployer to wrangle data bit first. Uh, so on ended attendances, I want to uh, filter um, on the specific uh, organization code. Let's say I want to look at organization is it capital? Sorry, uh, organization code um, equals uh, RRK. Um, I'm not even sure which hospital is to be honest. Uh, so, um, and then let's say uh, I want to look at breaches in uh, type one um, and the attendances. So, type equals uh, one. And let's say uh, here is just uh, I. I wanted to make a slightly more 
interesting and I picked up the period where things look very, very stable and it's very difficult to eyeball uh, when things can go wrong. So this last argument, sorry, this uh, other this last condition is just simply for like for this exercise, but obviously don't you you can yeah you can you can change your data as you wish uh, when you practice. You can even pick your own uh, trust if you want. So let's say you want our period B. Uh, so just because this was relatively uh, quite a uh, couple of months, uh, and then uh, oh, do something wrong. Okay, of course I did. No, I didn't. Hmm. Ah, yeah, of course. No, I don't know what I did wrong. Oh, okay, give me a second. I'll figure it out. Um, so. Okay, looks fine now. Anyway, sorry. Uh, in the ggplot, let's say uh, we want to see how many breaches happened over a period of time. Uh, so we are uh, plotting period and breaches, and we are just doing uh, geom line. Let's say. I mean, I can make it as pretty or um, as complex. Oh. Uh, Okay, uh, I assume it's just, okay, yeah, it's just my type, sorry. I can do it as pretty as, uh, and as complex as I want, uh, but uh, like this time period from um, 2016 uh, to, 20, uh, to the 2018, uh, or rather uh, in this financial years to this to April 2018 doesn't really give me much. Like, yeah, we have some mean, some high values and some low values here and there. Uh, but if I want to then uh, have mean line over here, uh, I will have to uh, create y-intercept. Uh, so yeah, some of you might be familiar with each plot. Uh, if I then want to have standard deviations, I need to calculate those and add them on myself uh, and like leave alone the fact that uh, I will have to do things like, um, I don't know, at least uh, give the, um, uh, give the uh, some sort of title. So let's say the main title would be uh, number of, and E breaches. Um, so yeah, something across these lines. Uh, but uh, what we can do instead is we can use energy as plotted dots uh, package. I'm just going to copy this thing here because I want to use exactly the same data. Uh, so just the same data rather than just the same filtering. Uh, and uh, the, 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 um, the, fu the function that would plot, the function we need called uh, PTD, uh, you can see the um, R already gave me a couple of uh, prompts, and the one we need is the middle one, uh, PTD underscore SPC, as a SPC uh, standing for statistical process control chart, and it explains here that it returns you the um, SPC chart. So uh, now uh, you don't, it's already built on ggplot, uh, ggplot so you don't need to uh, do anything else. Uh, the now the uh, arguments in your function, again, you can see here. So data we don't need because you do it as part of tplyr. So it's already referring to this as a data. And if, by the way, if people don't tend to use this pipe, don't tend to work with pipe operators, I'm very happy to talk through uh, about it as well. Um, so just, yeah, just give me shut, 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 uh, shut out, but hopefully this should make sense in a second. Uh, so then the, Next argument you would need is value field equals breaches. So what is the value of this data set you are, you are plotting? Uh, date field, uh, so what is the period column in your data set? Uh, it's called uh, period, uh, this is what we uh, looked at I did just, just back then. Uh, and uh, last one uh, is improvement direction. Uh, I mean, there are more, as you saw in this quick pop up, uh, there are much more uh, arguments, but this is just the main ones I want to show. And improvement direction is essentially just what direction some improvement is. So, if you want our number of breaches to be as low as possible, so improvement direction uh, is uh, decrease because you want all everything happening 
essentially we want our low outliers uh, be treated as okay and actually good thing now upper outliers uh, be treated as um, not good so when we run those um, you can see that the uh, you, can, you have lovely chart uh, again li living clone uh, all the uh, labs and a style and white background. It's yeah, it's it, it would take you a couple extra lines in GG plot for sure. Uh, but here, uh, what you have here is you have control limits. Uh, you have your uh, median. Uh, sorry, how you mean? Uh, I believe, and uh, you have your. Uh, so-called special cause improvements. So you have uh, your per uh, period and the number of uh, dots here where you have uh, uh, statistically significant improvement in your performance and you have a cause of concern happening in um, January 2017, which is not surprising uh, because uh, the winter pressures uh, happened in the NHS, uh, I think for the full history, or at least as long as we have the data for. Uh, so this is just very simple, uh, short exercise, uh, just um, so you have it and you know it, uh, it's not quite, well, it's somewhat corresponds to all we have, we have done just now, but it's slightly more, I guess, uh, about time series analysis, but can be very quick um, to implement. Are there are any questions about the descriptive statistics before we move on to inferential statistics? Uh, no questions, Anastasia, but just a recognition for me, that looks quite good. Yeah, thanks. To, uh, so Stuart has kindly shared loads of details about the package. Uh, so yes, uh, and uh, if you're going, uh, I mean, if you're on Slack, you can uh, always uh, say, uh, say hi to creators as well. Uh, and I think they will appreciate if you uh, actually use this as well in the future. Well. Cool. Uh, so then I will move on to the next part. Hopefully the screen has now switched to everyone uh, for to the next part. Uh, so I'm uh, not going to spend much time on it. Um, so the uh, so the probabilities and distributions. Uh, is something which we will have a look in a second, but uh, just a big disclaimer, it's more about background. Uh, so it's being used a lot in more complex, um, uh, in more complex modeling. It's used a lot uh, when you do hypothesis testing in the part three. Uh, so this is more just like background theory. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, and also we'll plot some uh, distributions and do look at some ways of plotting them uh, as well in the practice. Uh, so what we looked at just now with loads of different functions, uh, and it was uh, so-called descriptive statistics, uh, but we also have uh, so-called inferential statistics, uh, which is the the start the way the type of statistics that looks at inferences uh, in the data. Um, so we know about uh, we know about probabilities uh, from the uh, just, just our general knowledge. Uh, quite often, uh, we do think we discuss things like, you know, what what are the chances something will happen? What are the chances when we will the lottery? Uh, what are the chances, uh, you know, when I flip the coin that they will get heads? Um, and what quite often we refer as probability in our day-to-day -day life uh, is uh, so-called uh, frequentist view. So it's a view of statisticians who believe that. Uh, probability is just long run frequency. So if you uh, flip your coin at 15,000, 20,000, indefinite number of, of thousand times, uh, your probability of heads will be 0 0.5. Uh, they don't, uh, there, is, there is nothing else to it. You don't have any prior belief. Uh, you determine your, uh, when you do something more complicated with your probabilities, when you let's say determine your trend in your data, you look at your trend and then you calculate your confidence intervals uh, and you use your, your p-values uh, against something you might have seen in uh, let's say research papers when you looked at regression modeling uh, we will discuss p-values as well later so it's very what we, we what we're what we seeing around us is pretty much uh 95 percent frequency to you um bayesian view is not is very very modern, very fashionable now uh, among the scientists, uh, and it's built differently. Uh, so it's uh, it's so 
patients think that probability should then use some prior belief and some prior uh, pro probability as well. Uh, and also instead you might see on like things, I don't know, like there is bias in time structural time series. So it's on some forecasting, you might see that instead of calculating the um, the forecast as a values and then confidence intervals around it, what Bayesian statisticians would do is they would calculate confidence intervals and then derive uh, the mean value based on all possible options. So they, they view the world slightly different, almost the other way around. Um, and again, don't worry too much about it. Uh, there are some links uh, built, uh, in the slides, uh, but just uh, to let you know that in this uh, next section, it will be a more uh, classical uh, uh, view of uh, probability derived from frequencies. So, um, some hopefully very, very familiar charts here for you. Um, so, uh, so called uh, histogram, uh, because everyone has a frequency, uh, we can visual visualize it as a frequency uh, distribution, like all, all the things, not necessarily things with certain outcomes, like every, any event has a number of outcomes. Let's say uh, these are the examples of the data we just looked at. Uh, so this is our length of state data. Uh, e every uh, every possible outcome, let's say length of state equals one, length of state equals two, length of state equals three, etc. It all it has its own frequency, and as a result, it will have its own chances. So chart on the left here is just uh, beans. Uh, we call we call those uh, beans. Uh, so just the number of uh, beans and um, uh, how length of state distributed uh, across all our observations uh, we have. Um, and chart on the right is very similar. Uh, I mean, some would argue identical, uh, but for y-axis. Uh, so y-axis is different because instead of looking at frequency of an event, we look at probability of an event essentially. So uh, we look at it, how many cases out of 300 observations, uh, let's say we have that many uh, patients with length of stay. Uh, so we need to know distribution of our data uh, usually when we start analyzing it, uh, especially if you do more complex things, uh, let's say those even uh, just basic regression modeling, like um, we, when we do our linear model, the first thing you will need to do is check if your data is normally distributed, because if not, your usual linear model uh, couldn't work. Uh, the gave link here. I'm not sure if this uh, workshop being run this year as well, but last year there was a super helpful workshop from NHSR, uh, I believe, senior fellow, I believe, uh, Sean Mansi, uh, on fitting distributions in R. So do please have a look if you want to know specifically about how to fit them, because we're not going to cover it here. Uh, what we'll co cover, however, is just again simply for your knowledge and no need to remember any like any of the formulas here, just simply for your reference, is most common types of distribution. Uh, we can, the, the same way we split all our data at the start of the session, we can split all, all our distribution. So distributions of discrete data uh, will be uh, it's called discrete distributions and we have uh, bin, uh, binomial and Poisson. So binomial, it's just derived from, uh, from uh, our uh, dummy data. So you have coin, you're flipping, it's a, the coin, it's either, uh, zero or one if, if you if you're lucky if you're like me i'm not capable of flipping any coins so unfortunately uh but yeah it's just very uh, it's just very distribution and it's just classic distribution here classic normal distribution uh, as you would expect very sym symmetrical uh in, term, in in the sense that if you draw the line but it's not normal because it's not continuous va values and then you have Poisson distribution, which is very similar. You have discrete values, but instead, let's say you have not just uh, like binary outcome, but you have uh, things like length of stay or days until something um, uh, or number of calls in your GP practice. Uh, so quite often, uh, many things we have to analyze operationally in the NHS will be Poisson distribution. Um, and I mean, simply visually, some might argue that actually this distribution you have here is Poisson, uh, but we will discuss it in a second, uh, in the third part, I believe, as well. So this is uh, the discrete distributions. 
and then you have continuous, you have normal distribution. Uh, not many things are normally distributed in the real world, uh, but people argue the birth weight is. Um, you have uh, on on left and right, you will have some, um, not as many people, uh, not as many babies being born, uh, either very uh, underweight or very overweight, but you will have somewhat a uh, bell-shaped curve, and that's why sometimes normal distribution also being called uh, bell curve or uh, also called Gaussian uh, distribution as well. And also you have exponential distrib uh, distribution to not be mixed with, uh, ooh, I think I have typo here as well. Let me, I'll record it somewhere uh, as well. Uh, exponential distribution to not be mixed with uh, the uh, exponential growth we all heard about during pandemic. Uh, so it's just essentially uh, the way to, to say that all your data is, is uh, can be represent all your continuous data this is important can be represented uh, by some function of exp uh, exponenta. Uh, and usually one of the most common examples is a duration of GP call. Uh, it will you look something like green. Uh, so yeah, exponential distribution will have different par parameters. So again, don't worry too much about those. But usually your GP call duration will look something like green or blue line, you will have people being dealt with relatively quickly, uh, but you'll have a um, couple of people being dealt with for being on the call uh, with uh, to, to the GP practice for much longer. Um, and then what we will do, though, just uh, as a part of this workshop is we will try to plot distributions. Uh, and again, this is something you might have done uh, in the past. Um, so very simple thing we have we had already seen is histogram, uh, which you see on the left. It's great. It's it works perfectly. It's quick as well as you will find out. Uh, but it relies on the number of beams, because if we can do it, we can look at this in a second as well. But if you only try to split all your all your uh, all your uh, data in. Uh, let's say three beans, it will look something like this. One bin here, small bin here, slightly bigger bin here. So it's it's not going to give you much. Uh, so the 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 fact that you'll have an eyeball, if you want to um, understand your distribution visually rather than statistically, means that you more likely um, um, be kind of have some sort of biases and not identify your distribution correctly. Uh, that's why people tend to use uh, density line a lot. Uh, this just very similar instead of frequency, you just use the, uh, the, uh, the density proportions, which is slightly different from probabilities, but we're not going to go uh, in the induction course into this. Uh, but also you can overlay things as well. Um, so we will uh, look at a couple of things, uh, well, sorry, a couple of ways uh, doing plotting in R. And if you use G plot, you can do pretty much whatever you want and overlay things and add text and everything, um, which again, not part of this workshop, but there are very good ggplot uh, materials as well. And just some extra ways to plot distribution, uh, again, might be more or less familiar to you, uh, might be not as common, is uh, our box plots and value charts, and box plots are great. It's one of, um, I think, um, one of the well, it's very it's not as common as histograms, and uh, unfortunately, or density lines, but it's very great way to summarize your data in one, um, like literally in one chart. Because as you can see here, uh, well, we, these are three box plots by group, uh, so uh, no, slightly different uh, to usual box plot. But let's say in group A specifically, you will have your median line, you will have your interquartile range. You will have your kind of control limits uh, derived as a, a formula using control ranges. Uh, and uh, then you can also see your outliers being um, also uh, identified automatically. Um, and yeah, uh, I agree with the participants as well here that even better ways could be violin. And you can actually, um, so violin itself is more kind of uh, it's combination of box plot and density. And in this example, they actually uh, combined both uh, on the uh, uh, on the uh, on the chart. Uh, so it's it's also great. You, you have all the all the same uh, things as box plot, uh, and uh, we will uh, plot those in a second as well. So this is all on probabilities. So again, this was probability theory itself was just for your reference for part three, but the main 
uh, the main thing for this part will be uh, to do some plotting. So if I go back to RStudio Cloud um, and open parts to classroom, which I believe, I think I tried to correct my embarrassing typo. Uh, yes, I did, but you will have to correct it uh, here at the start uh, to refer to correct vectors. Um, or if you in your uh, on your desktop, you can just uh, take the um, yeah, you can just download or copy code from GitHub. But yet again, I haven't haven't committed changes yet. Um, so yeah. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, this is yeah, this is great chart. Sorry, I have a great example of a uh, valiant plot. I, I, I'm not going to focus as much on GDPlot, so these are not going to be anywhere as pretty. Uh, but yeah, um, I love box plots and valiant plots a lot. So anyway, uh, shall we then start? Um, so I mean, as I said, you don't really need to run those things anyway, because it's just only if you do this exercise um, separately from each other. Um, so I am uh, going to start from just, as I said, it's going to be only plotting, and I'm going to uh, start from uh, plotting a histogram, uh, again, something uh, some of you might have already done. And uh, as I said earlier, there are various ways uh, to do this. Uh, so one is using base R, uh, and base R has a function called hist. So if you run a hist uh, length of stay, uh, here, you hopefully see exactly what we have seen earlier in our presentation. Interesting, you have uh, people, uh, mo mo most of people staying, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying most, but let's say uh, more than half people staying up, uh, up to five days. Uh, and then you have this long tail here. Um, if you want to then uh, do the density histogram instead. So here you have row count, your row frequencies. If you want to do your density instead, all you need to do is to specify your frequency to uh, false, which means that then instead of having frequency here, you will have a dense kind of, well, it's not necessarily density plot. It's not, not density line, it's density histograms. So you'll have your probabilities on your uh, y-axis. Uh, but of course, like it's not ideal. I'm, again, I'm sure many of you has used uh, base R plotting before, so I'm just going to quickly uh, say here as well that as uh, as with plot two, you can also do things like adding titles, adding x axis labels, etc. But I mean, ggplot two is so much better. So I'm going to uh, still do it. Uh, do just here uh, as a main title, just so people just we have it. Uh, but also, you know, there are some things by default I don't like at all. Like I don't like not being able to see like what the, this end of the uh, histogram for some reason. So I'm just going to do x lame um, equals zero to twenty. Uh, and I mean, you can change colors. Uh, you, you can yeah, you can change colors. You can change. Uh, like other things, you can definitely change uh, x-axis and color length of stay rather than abbreviation loss. So yeah, lots of ways. Um, and also just to make people aware that if you do want to do ggplot, uh, so the violin chart. So for example, there are like there are violin base charts, but there are the violin charts in uh, uh, shared uh, by uh, one of participants. Uh, in the chat, I'm only not saying name just in case the person doesn't want me to say name uh, on the recording. Um, it's definitely, I guess, done in ggplot too because then you could see that you can do different overlays and everything. So yeah, if you don't want to do your histogram in ggplot way, it's also very, very simple. So you have your data set, you have your aesthetics, your x-axis being length of stay. And you can then, uh, I mean, pretty much uh, just uh, Add uh, say uh, built on the layers, say built on the, and add function called geom histogram. And I mean, even if you don't do anything inside, uh, you can pretty much. Oh, uh, okay, something went. Oh, okay, it's the data set, the yeah, lost data set. Um, you can pretty much run it um, as it is. I mean, this is just not 
nice. Uh, so you would want to unify your uh, you would want to unify your width of your beans. So let's say uh, you have been this one, uh, and let's say you can change your field to blue, or you can um, uh, rather blue in this. I think it's in the quotation marks. Yeah, I mean obviously not great uh, as well either. So I don't know, let's do the, uh, what have I done in the thing? I think I've done the color equals uh, white. Yeah, so something more manageable, but obviously it's quite quite a series of blue, not NHS blue. But yeah, and anyway, if you you know if you have ggplot two, if you have theme, you might have your own team theme. You might have you might, you might use NHS theme package. You 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 are so much more flexible than with your base um, hist function as well. So moving on to the uh, density line. Uh, so density plots uh, again using ggplot two is very easy to do. So you can uh, do exactly the same. I mean, I could have copied it. So you can um, specify your aesthetics, uh, your x-axis, and then just uh, run, run your density instead. Uh, so this uh, will, uh, again, uh, give you very, uh, very basic but somewhat efficient chart here. So now you don't depend on number of beans you have in so much uh, or um, number of uh, I think it's called uh, it's called breaks so you can see more it is a smooth line um, but again the uh, your uh, your conclusions will be still very similar and you will likely think that your distribution is Poisson distribution so this is uh, the density line and on the uh, in the slides, we have seen the version when you can overlay both, and this is again, as I said, where uh, where your um, uh, where, where your a digiplot uh, where digiplot comes very handy essentially because you wouldn't be able, I don't think, to do it as well. You can do it, but it would be slightly more difficult to do it using base R. So here, I'm just going to copy this part with aesthetics because it's uh, quite quite repetitive. Uh, and instead, what uh, I want to do is uh, I want to do a geom histogram. So I'll start from doing histogram. I'll um, specify my aesthetics here because of because instead of count, I want to have it as a density instead. Um, so I'll do it as a density. I will then, uh, I think I will then copy other things from earlier, just to keep things as they were quite painful blue, but um, I'll have to roll with it for now. Um, so yeah, so all the very similar other than the fact that we are changing our y-axis because you want to overlay histogram on density. So we want them both to have the same um, y-axis. Uh, and then uh, you can just uh, use the geom density function uh, and you can leave it. Uh, you can leave it uh, just empty as, as it is, uh, but it will not. It won't be as nicely like fill uh, and overlay as it was in this uh, in the slide. So if you do want to do it as an overlay, uh, what you can do is you can specify your alpha, for example, zero point two, and you can specify the color of your field. I don't know, yellow might be quite uh, again. Bright, well, not as bright, uh, but yeah, nice, nice, nice combination. I think if blue was slightly less, uh, yeah, sl slightly less blue and more NHS blue. Um, but yeah, you can, you can obviously, as I said, there are much nicer charts in in the uh, in the chat of this workshop. But yeah, you can, you again, you can be very flexible. You can then have just the intercept of mean, uh, or you can. Um, you know, if 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 you have you, you notice you have this like one observation of thing of, of very high value of 18 because now the maximum is 18 from our previous work uh, previous uh, exercise, you can then just overlay it with text saying we have this long stair etc. Um, so yeah, so this is quite quite handy. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, yeah, no no questions. So moving on to the bo box plots. Uh, very similar to histograms, uh, you can just use base R. So you can just use function uh, boxplot. Uh, 
and you can um, you can do the uh, box plot of length of stay as a uh, as a vector, I believe, uh, which well again not very pretty, uh, but can work. However, what I do want to show you here is I want to show you the ways to do this multiple box plots because I believe that the the beauty of box plots is that I find them more visual when you have them grouped by uh, then uh, let's say if you would have multiple uh, density lines or multiple histograms with overlay. So if you want to do box plot by group and if you want to use base R, so the simple way is you can use the uh, kind of wave symbol. Uh, you might have seen it in functions using an, like in function argument of the of regression model before. Um, and what it will do, do it will it will split. Uh, it will kind of say that you're defining your length of stay as as as, as a defining it via via the variable called death. So what I want to see is I want to see the distribution of length of stay by the death status. Um, so uh, if I do it uh, this way, uh, I can just uh, um, I, I can just do it quick, quickly uh, and have two separate. Uh, box plots uh, for those who have died and for those who haven't died. Uh, so I'm just going to specify loss data set. Um, and I think, I mean, you're, again, you're pretty much good to go, but you can, uh, if you want, a similar way to histogram, add a title. And if you want to do the same thing in ggplot2, um, you can do it as well. So uh, the only thing will be different is that ggplot2 uh, shows the uh, asks for aesthetics. So I'm going to um, type it here. So you have your aesthetics is death, uh, but I believe that our death here is by, uh, yes, integer, so it's not factor. So you should specify that it's as a factor because otherwise the R will get confused about grouping. Um, so X equals as factor death and uh, your uh, y equals length of stay. So I specified your statics and then uh, you can just uh, do your box plot. And it should give you a very similar picture with default ggplot style. So this is quite helpful here. Um, so you can see that if you split your uh, sample by those who have died and those who haven't died, you can see that those who have not died have um, uh, have a uh, lower median length of stay uh, and overall uh, lower kind of uh, maximum end range as well. Uh, they also seem to be more variation in length of stay of those who died compared to those who have not died. Your interquartile ranges are um, visually uh, wider, uh, but it seems that those who you can argue those who have not died had slightly more skewed data. Uh, and also they have one outlier. I don't think this one is necessarily tells any story at all, um, but uh, I guess it's uh, still quite good to know if you do have those outliers. Uh, and it's, as I said, very helpful to be able to see them. Uh, so, and then uh, moving on to the uh, last one is the violin plot. Um, so I am going to, uh, copy this part over because I, I don't want to type it all over again. And as you would guess, the only difference with violin plot is instead of using geom um, underscore box plot, you will be using geom underscore violin. Uh, and if I do it here now, uh, and if I run this, um, you will see that our violins look a bit more like quasars. Uh, which is okay, but of what you'd expect. And just to let you know that the catch here is that by default, uh, for some reasons, uh, the, the package was created, uh, the violin, uh, when the cocoa statistics, they're trimming outliers uh, and the trimming extreme values. Uh, so if you want to, uh, if you want to have your violin plot for all values, you need to specify your trim uh, equals true false. And you can see here that, yeah, uh, now you have low value of this, low number of these extreme values in as well. Uh, and it looks more like uh, violin would look. So this is just um, sometimes catches you uh, because 
usually by default things are more likely to be false than true, but this is a slightly different example. And again, uh, as you saw uh, in the chat and as you saw in uh, presentations and everywhere, you can do your charts as pretty uh, as you wish. So you can add things like, um, uh, like title, uh, X, access title as well, and everything else. Uh, but just again, to be consistent with slides, I want to uh, show you the um, how to add summary statistics. Uh, so I'm going to copy this value part in, and I'm going to specify uh, the next um, the, uh, add on the next layer, which is uh, uh, stat summary. So let's say we want to add median as a as a dot. Uh, or as a, you can add a square, I'm going to add as a dot uh, on as a layer on your violin. Um, and let's say I'm doing it as a point uh, with, uh, well, we can specify size as well. Uh, so it's somewhat big. Uh, so if I do it here, you can see that now you know where the median is, uh, but not, I mean, you don't know anything else, it's not as helpful. And if you want to overlay it with box plot, uh, you can then instead just uh, do this and then just add your box plot as a separate layer. Uh, so you can add your box plot as a separate layer. Uh, and the only thing is if you do it again, if you do it by default, it works, uh, but it's not very, uh, most, no, not the most pleasing. So you'll need to play around and specify the width of your box plot. Um, so in the example I did, I think 0 0.1 was good. Yeah. So again, now what you see here is exactly the box plot you have seen with this outlier, and you have it uh, as well nicely by the uh, like you have your median here as well where the dots were before. So this is like pretty much all you need to know on that stage about probabilities. So hopefully this was helpful as well as a slight kind of detour uh, to, the, um, to the probabilities and how to plot them and distributions as well. Uh, so uh, I will now, I'll open part three class from now, but I will switch on back on to the uh, last part, which is, uh, well, we'll have 40 minutes, but hopefully it shouldn't take as much anyway. Um, and I'm going to talk through about the uh, the statistical testing and relationship between variables as well. Um, so, so far we had a look at the descriptive, descriptive statistics. Uh, and what we have uh, quite, uh, you might have find surprising what we have missed is we have not actually discussed uh, how to see whether there are any relationship between uh, variables uh, at all. So uh, the the main concept uh, on which the the all uh, other statistical concept about relationship between variables built is uh, covariance. So covariance is the metric that looks at how um, kind of how dependent variables are on each other. Uh, and it looks at uh, variance of both x, uh, x variable and y variable. And it's, it's quite informative because if it's positive, it means that there is a, a kind of strong estimated re uh, like relationship, so they're dependent on each other. But the actual magnitude of the effect doesn't tell you much at all. That's why it the, we use correlation a lot, and the correlation we know is usually uh, Pearson correlation here uh, is also using covariance to calculate. And sometimes when you see correlation, you usually see it as a number between zero and one. It's quite, um, I would say, uh, up to person to understand and interpret as a, anything else in statistics. But some people somewhat agree that everything is uh, between 0 0.4, 0 0.7 is moderate. So you would need at least 0 0.4 to say that there is some relationship between variables. Uh, but if it's more than 0 0.7, it's weak. And if it's uh, 0 0.9, it's strong. Uh, but you very strong, but you don't. Sorry, if it's between 0 0.7 and 0 0.9 is strong, and if it's above 0 0.9, it's very strong, but you don't often have uh, such high correlations in real life. 
Uh, we're going to do a couple of ways uh, to uh, look at correlation right now. Uh, there are correlation metrics. Uh, as a, we, just, uh, we discussed Pearson correlation, but there is also Pearson correlation uh, if you look at qualitative original variables. Um, there is correlation matrix if you want to look at all of the correlations uh, at the same time. And there is scatter plot and correlogram as well. Scatter plot is just two variables plotted together. Correlogram is when you have many variables, it's kind of nice mix between visual and correlation matrix. Uh, and there are very nice handy package for it as well. Uh, so, and one, as we discussed probabilities, uh, you also, I also want to mention that if you want to test correlation, you can also do it using so-called hypothesis testing. So this is the new uh, concept we haven't introduced earlier. Uh, so in the same way, we researchers have hypothesis and saying, let's say sugar causes obesity or smoking causing lung cancer, statisticians have their work with hypothesis as well. Uh, so if uh, if you want to make a judgment call about certain things, let's say you want to say mean of this variable is five, or you want to say there is no correlation between those two variables, uh, we can specify it as a hypothesis and test it statistically. Uh, so in this case, uh, we want to say that uh, our hypothesis that the, in between two variables, uh, yes, uh, between two variables, um, the true correlation isn't zero, so there is some relationship between variables. Uh, and also uh, our alternative hypothesis then is just our, um, our uh, like uh, essentially the same thing as other way around. So our alternative hypothesis, there is no relationship. Um, and uh, the, we can then run the statistical tests and based on probabilities of all and distribution of all probabilities, uh, we can then see whether with 95% in 95% of cases, whether there is any relationship or not. And you can do the same thing with any other things as well. Uh, so this is just one of the ways um, to also check for correlation, but correlation isn't causation. So if you want to do whether one thing causing the other, you uh, don't need to do regression model, even then uh, it, it, intuitions will argue that it's not causation is about association. Um, so yeah, definitely correlation is good as far as there is some uh, relationship, there is some uh, correspondence between age and death. And even though we know that age causing death in most cases, uh, we cannot tell for sure if you don't do regression, if you just do correlation uh, uh, matrix or correlation uh, coefficient. Uh, and also you can use hypothesis testing, as I said, for any other things. Uh, two most common hypothesis tests are student's t-test and Welsh t-test, uh, and we will do them both uh, right now as well. Um, and this is very uh, one of the most common, I guess, scenarios where you would want to do uh, statistical tests in your day-to-day -day healthcare analysis, analytics job is when you, let's say, comparing things either before or after the event, or just comparing two things uh, together. Um, so. Uh, then you can, in the same fashion as the correlation uh, uh, test uh, earlier, you can just say your one hypothesis one is that you there is uh, some difference in mean, so the groups are somewhat different, uh, and the difference in mean isn't equal to zero, and your hypothesis uh, zero is that there is uh, the difference in means is zero, so there is uh, no distinction between the groups. Uh, so we will uh, do the practice uh, right now. So if you open your uh, part three classroom, uh, again, no need to run any of the packages uh, all over again. Uh, so you can see that we only need this uh, LOS dataset again, which again, you should have in now. Uh, so the simple, uh, um, so the, the simple start is to look at Pearson correlation uh, and you can, uh, do it very, very easily, uh, just uh, via, the, uh, via using function co called core. Uh, so again, you can just either use data set you have here or uh, let's say loss data set uh, H and uh, loss uh, data set length of stay. So if you want to see if there is correlation between age and length of stay, 
Uh, and we can see that, yes, uh, there is, as you know, moderate correlation. So it's nearly 0 0.5, uh, but it's more, um, it's on the low spectrum of moderate correlation. Uh, now we just did correlation of two, uh, uh, of two variables, uh, which is good, but not helpful when you have whole data set, you don't want to do it over and over again. Um, so that's why you can just use it for the correlation matrix. Um, however, uh, the, uh, the part about this function is that the data needs to be numeric. In our lost data set, we have um, our first two well, first two variable, first variable is like mistakenly numeric uh, because it's just number of uh, ID, person ID, you don't really need it as much. And now second variable is organization. So we don't really need it as much either. So I can just uh, using base R just remove uh, the first two columns from here. Uh, so should hopefully work. I don't know, no, it doesn't like it. Uh, uh, oh, gosh. yeah, I can see why. Sorry, apologies. I can definitely cannot type anymore. Cool. Yeah, so I just, uh, I mean, I just used based R and removed, temporarily removed two first columns from the lost data set. And I can now have correlation matrix that it looks exactly as on the slides. So you can just look at correlation across the variables um, from row to column. So obviously our correlation of H with H is perfect. It's one, uh, it's the same values. Um, our correlation of H is length of stay is 0 0.49 and H with death is 0 0.12. And our correlation of, uh, for example, length of stay with, with death is 0 0.21. Um, also, we discussed the visual ways uh, to do the uh, to do the uh, to understand if you have correlation. I'm not going to use base R now. I think we just leave it blank because of the time. Uh, but it's just a function called plot. So you just well, okay. I'll, I think we should have time. I'll type it now. So I'm just going to use this copy length. So I'm going to plot uh, length of stay against H. Uh, so I'm just going to copy these things from the top. And yeah, it's not very informative. You have our um, uh, kind of, you, you can see that there is some uh, correlation, but it's not as uh, helpful and informative as, uh, as in some other cases. Um, and you can also do the scatter plot using ggplot2. So you can specify your, as always, your aesthetics, uh, your variables, uh, of interest and you can just add geom point in as well. So this is uh, the scatter plot using ggplot2, very similar, but again, you can then add lines, add titles, add labs uh, and um, use it in the, um, for more uh, interesting messages. And then the other handy package I want to talk about is, uh, called core plot. So this is what uh, you will need to use uh, for this nice mix of the, uh, for this nice mix of correlation matrix uh, and visual representation, which is called correlogram. Um, so core plot uh, is, um, is very useful, useful package uh, when you want to present your correlation matrix in a nice way, but also if you just, don't, if you feel like you have a bit of fatigue from um, black and white table uh, here, from black and white table here, um, you, I sometimes just find it helpful run it instead because it's also just one line of the code. Um, so let's say that uh, all you need to do is you need to get your correlation matrix, which you have already done anyway. So instead of just running it, you let's say, assigning it to object called core underscore matrix. So you can just copy it from the top and run it. Um, and then all you need to do to get this uh, correlogram is to run a function called core plot. And uh, inside you can see the, oh, it disappeared, but the arguments you need uh, the first argument is your correlation matrix, uh, which we have created, but likewise, you could just type it inside. Uh, you didn't have to assign it to an object, it's just handy because you can then um, be more flexible. Uh, and then you can specify various me methods. So one of the methods is 
uh, circle. Uh, this is nice, uh, but I guess not as uh, not as clear because you only have uh, circles uh, as a size of the circle is how strong correlation is and the color is whether it's positive as a blue or negative uh, as a red. Uh, if you want to have number, you just change the method uh, to number. And now it's just number uh, having certain color code based on your um, how strong the correlation is. If you don't like that, it's keep repeating things again and again because correlation matrix shows you correlation uh, across all the same variables again and again. So you, it will be perfectly symmetrical. You can specify your type as either uh, lower or upper. So this is lower. So it will only keep your lower part of the correlation matrix, uh, but more, the more common one is upper one. So this one you might have seen uh, in presentations before. And uh, last but not least as well, uh, you can, if you want, uh, combine both and you can, let's say, do uh, copy this file that's code in, specify method as circle, uh, but instead uh, you can also have, or, or rather not instead, but in addition, uh, you can also have the uh, extra argument uh, called add coef.call. Uh, and uh, this will add coefficient of correlation to your numbers as well. Again, not the best choice of color. You might want to do uh, red. Well, again, not the best choice of color, but uh, you got the uh, the memo, so you can add numbers to your circles as well. And there are ways. So the the um, correlation in the slides was slightly different. So it was the um, in the squares rather than circles. So this is uh, on the uh, uh, so this is on the uh, correlation. Uh, now, uh, as I said, you can use hypothesis testing for various things. You can test if you want things, if you want to know whether there is correlation. Uh, you can test your distribution. Uh, you can test uh, if your mean equals to something or if your means equal uh, to uh, to each other. So the testing correlation uh, is very easy. All you need is a function called core.test. Uh, and all you need for core.test is to specify what exactly you're testing. So again, I'm going to scroll a bit up and copy our vectors up and um, put them in. Uh, so here it uh, tells you what is happening. It gives you t value our degrees of freedom, which is number of observation minus number of variables. So we have 300 observations. We are testing two variables. Uh, and it has our p-value, uh, which is uh, kind of the probability that you are, um, that, well, essentially, if it's, it's probability that you're rejecting your uh, hypothesis. So uh, what we have here is that our hydrogen hypothesis, so our hypothesis H1, is that correlation isn't equal to 0. Uh, we accept because our p-value is less than 0 0.05. Um, and as a result, we're saying that there is a correlation and it's truly not equal to zero, which we kind of, well, we knew that it's uh, somewhat moderate, but we didn't know whether it's significant or not, but uh, it is uh, significant. Um, and this, uh, this is very helpful, as I said, if you want to just do your correlation, but the correlation is not causation, so do, uh, do be careful uh, when you uh, explain the results to less technical uh, audience. Um, as well, if you can use your hypothesis testing, if you want, uh, instead of fitting your distribution visually, if you want to uh, check if it's normal or not um, statistically. So the one of the very helpful tests is called Shapiro test. So Shapiro test is possibly the most common test when you test for uh, distribution because it tests if distribution is normal or not. Uh, so uh, again, I'm going to uh, do a Shapiro test on our length of stay uh, because it's something we have plotted in the previous exercise. Um, and 
this is slightly less helpful summary because it doesn't tell you what your electronic hypothesis is and it catches quite a lot of people uh, because this is um, so the hypothesis is actually the h1 is saying that distribution is not normal and your alternative hypothesis h uh, h1 says it's not normal and your null hypothesis h0 says, says that it is normal uh, so it's i find it slightly less intuitive than uh, your t-test or welsh test we will do in a second um, but if you uh if you, you can always just google uh and have a look at the function um information uh but yeah here we have our p-value very low less than 0 0.05 um so we are saying that our distribution is not normal because we are accept our h1 hypothesis and reject our h0 hypothesis so then uh what we are uh, what you can do last but not least uh, is compare means um, so I uh, w w there are a couple of again lots of ways to do it uh, so I'm going to just do it in a very quick easy way and copy the rest uh, from the code uh, so let's say we want to do uh, the uh, the kind of thing we have done earlier and let's say we want to look at if um, uh, for our people who have passed away and who haven't passed away, there is a statistical significant difference uh, between length of stay and how long they spent in the hospital. So to do t-test, all you need to do is use function t.test. And if you want to test it by group, there is again, using the same uh, syntax you used for box plots, uh, you can specify that you're looking at testing length of stays means by death, uh, death being your um, your groups, and that you're using data from lost data set. Uh, so very quick and easy. Uh, if you run it now, what it will show you, it will show you the name of the test. You're using Welsh t-test. And Welsh, uh, we can, uh, I'll, I will copy code in a second, show you the difference with student t-test. Um, and it will, same way, gives you t-value, t p-value, um, gives you hypothesis as well, which is super helpful. So you know that you're testing H1, that uh, the, there is difference, there is true, di true difference is uh, in means, and your p-value is very low. Uh, so it means that there is a definite, so you know your means are 4.5 and 6.5, or sorry, 4.6 and 6.6, .6, but now you know that uh, the difference is statistically significant at 95%. Uh, I'm just going to quickly copy this part of the code um, from GitHub just to, um, to just to show you um, that uh, essentially you obviously what you can do instead is you can longer way around would be to create separate vectors of length of stay for those who died and those who did not and then to test them. Uh, also, this was exactly, that's exactly the same thing. It's just slightly longer because you have to then wrangle your data yourself. Um, but uh, it still gives you exactly the same results as it should. Um, and then the only difference between student t-test and Welsh t-test, as I said earlier on slides, is that uh, t student t-test uh, has to the main one of the main assumptions that the variance in these uh, groups will be the same, uh, but it might not be because you don't know. Well, in fact, we know we know from our box plots that the variation uh, in uh, uh, in uh, length of stay for those who have died and also have not is uh, different because in, we saw the usually interquartile ranges were quite different. Um, so if you do want to do students to test instead, you can just specify that your var dot equal argument. Uh, so the equality of variation argument should true, and then it will. Oh, that and then it will run um yeah it will run different tests and uh you can see it's called sample to test and it will give you slightly different results then so this as i said welsh test is super helpful when you're comparing things uh but should really be used in conjunction with other things so this was uh quite a, yeah, quite a quick overview of all the different things you can do. So apologies if it wasn't quite what you expected in terms of the level, like 
either way around, or any, any way around. Um, and if apologies for some technical issues at the start as well, I will update all the uh, code and slide on GitHub and then cloud so you can access it in the future if needed. Uh, but I think I will say thank you here and stop recording, but I will stay on online as well, just to say that please, uh, please share the feedback with us because it was first time we run this workshop. Uh, I do, I, I did love it, uh, but I do want to make sure it's useful and if I can update it, what should I do? Uh, but also if you have